Today, superannuation trick or treat? Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, one that is post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Well, I'm getting all sorts of messages from people regarding their superannuation savings, and they're all saying they're going down, and quite quickly. So what is the true story here? And the question I keep asking is, is superannuation really fit for purpose in the current environment? Well, it's interesting because Senator Rennock actually made some statements last week, which I'll play later in the show, which really chime with my own views that really superannuation is there more to support the financial system than it is to help individuals with their retirement savings. Anyway, according to APRA, superannuation assets decreased 4.4% during the June 2022 quarter. The balances are now $3.3 trillion. And for the year ended June 2022, there was a 0.5% decrease in the value of total superannuation assets. So you can see that they went up and they've come back down. And of course, since then, values have deteriorated further because the markets are down quite a lot more. APRA also said that contributions totaled around $44.5 billion for the quarter and $146.5 billion for the year ended June 2022. That's a 15.2% increase compared to June 21. That followed strong growth in both employer and personal member contributions. Employer contributions totaled $30.9 billion for the quarter and $108.6 billion for the year ended June 2022. That's a 10.2% increase over the year compared to 2021. And over the year, superannuation guarantee, SG, contributions were $82.2 billion and accounted for around three quarters of employer contributions. That reflects the increase in the SG contribution rate and a stronger labour force, with unemployment rates dropped to record lows, of course, during recent months in June 2022. Member contributions totaled $13.6 billion for the quarter, more than double the amount of contributions made in the previous quarter, and in line with past years, this is likely due to members taking advantage of financial year end tax incentives, such as fully utilising concessional and non-concessional contribution caps. Regardless, member contributions over the year have been strong, totaling $37.9 billion for the year, ending June 2022. That's a 32.3% increase over the year compared to June 2021. The main driver of this has been a strong increase in personal contributions on the back of increased household savings during the onset of COVID-19. Benefits paid out total $23.2 billion for the quarter and $85.8 billion for the year, ending June 2022. This is a decline of 9.5% over the year compared to June 2021, as payments return to normal levels following the end of the earlier release scheme withdrawals. Lump sum payments totaled $12.1 billion over the quarter, and pension payments totaled $11.1 billion, which are in line with long-term trend levels. Quarterly net contribution flows, that's contributions plus net benefit transfers, less benefit payments, total $23.4 billion over the June 2022 quarter. And the net contribution flows for the year and June 2022 was $63.6 billion compared to $33.8 billion for the year and June 2021, similarly reflecting the strong growth in overall contributions and the waning impact of the early withdrawal scheme. But the rate of return for entities with more than four members for the June quarter was down 6% and for the year down 4.2%. That's a significant decrease compared to the annual return of June 21, which was 17%. The June 2022 quarter was turbulent for global financial markets as asset prices continue to adjust in a rising interest rate environment and many central banks globally continued to increase interest rates in response to high levels of inflation driven by constrained supply chains and the continuing geopolitical uncertainty predominantly relating to the conflict in Ukraine. The five-year average analysed return was 5.2%. That's down from 8% in June 2021. And over the June 2022 quarter, total assets decreased by 4.2% or $104.3 billion. And with over $2.1 trillion in investments, 52.5% of investments were in equities. 
That's 21.6% in Australian listed equities, 25.7% in international listed equities, and 5.2% in unlisted equities. Fixed income and cash investments accounted for 28.9% of total investments, 18.6% in fixed income and 10.3% in cash. Property and infrastructure accounted for 16.1% of total investments, while other assets, including hedge funds and commodities, accounted for 2.4%. Now, there's a couple of very important points here. First, of course, overall values are down, thanks to the fact that stock markets are down and bond valuations are down. Secondly, even in cash, a lot of people are actually not holding real cash, they're holding bonds, and bonds have dropped in value significantly too. And it's an interesting observation that even if you are actually in a cash-related superannuation fund, you are still losing money, partly because you're not really in cash, but most likely in bonds. And bonds have dropped in value. And also, of course, all superannuation funds take fees. And specifically in a low growth, no growth environment, the fees are pretty disastrous in terms of all returns because they'll be taken year after year, whether you're going up or whether you're going down in terms of absolute values. And in fact, on average, around $30 billion worth of fees are taken out each year by the industry intermediaries, such as advisors and managers. And I keep making the point that the overall return of the fund may not be the same as the return for individuals in the fund because of the extra fees that are actually not openly disclosed. So the question you've got to ask yourself is, does this make sense in the current environment? Well, interest rates are going to stay high for quite some time. I think markets are going to be on the downside. That's probably true for bonds and it's certainly true for equities. So it is likely that superannuation funds will continue to degrade in terms of performance. That's a problem, of course, because when you come to retirement, the pot might be smaller than you might think. But there's another factor to bear in mind, too. In the current environment, where people are finding it difficult to pay their mortgages on time, some banks are now suggesting that they should switch to longer terms or interest only and use superannuation to pay down the capital on their property later. Now, that's an interesting observation because it means that effectively superannuation funds will be used to offset mortgage balances later rather than to provide income into retirement. And there are two consequences of that. Firstly, it means that people will go into retirement with much lower balances or no balances, putting them immediately on the pension from the government. And secondly, of course, the banks are effectively indirectly raiding superannuation, not now but later, to pay off those mortgages, those really big mortgages that were made when they should never have been made in the first place. So then the question is, is superannuation a rot? Who are the winners and who are the losers? Q Senator Gerard Rennick, who made this contribution to the debate last week in the Senate. It's worth listening to because I have to say, I think he's on to something Senator rather important. Thank you. Uh acting deputy president, and what would you call the offspring of communism, Marxism and fascism? And of course the answer to that is superannuation. First of all, it's communism, because in 1992, Paul Keating introduced superannuation that takes the workers' wages, didn't give them a choice, didn't give them a choice, started it off at 2 per cent and said, we're going to give it to someone you've never met and there's no guarantee you're going to get it back when you're 60. Now, just like the vaccine mandates, that money was taken from them. And do you think if Paul Keating had taken that question to an election, it would have got up? Absolutely not. Do you think if Paul, Paul Keating had said in 1992 that by 2025 you're going to have 12 per cent of your wages taken out of the workers' wages, the workers, mind, mind you, who built this country, this country was built by the battlers. It wasn't built by the blowhards who were sucking the $30 billion of fees out of superannuation every year. It was built by the battlers, acting uh, uh, deputy chair. I was just about to throw them at him in there, but I apologise for that. OK. And I, and I will still argue that it is a breach of the Constitution. You are taking away their property rights without any guarantee that they will get that capital returned to them when they are 60, uh, discounted for present value. Right? Communism. Marxism. What's got, what have we got now is we've got industry super funds and we've got BlackRock and Vanguard on the private sector. And I'm not doing this from some ideological left versus right platform here. I'm doing this from the big guy versus the little guy. 
okay, the little guys who get up every day, get out of bed, put their nose to the grindstone, they get the lowest wages in this country and you're ripping off 12 per cent of their income to give it to someone they've never met so they can gouge $30 billion in fees every year. And then what you've done is you've taken that money, it's unelected money, there's no control over how it's spent, the superannuation boards are not elected by the members. So that, that just undermines all the powers of the, of, the, of, of the individual and how their money is spent. And then the superannuation funds appoint their own directors to, point their, to appoint their own ideological agendas. So when Senator McAllister says it's an ideological battle, you, 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 you're straight. You, can you say D-A-N-N or not? But not say. So. I, I won't say. You, you're straight that it is. You're very correct it is because the, the, the superannuation boards are using this for an ideological to push their ideological boards. And last of all, and this is you know this is also fascism because we've now got corporations that are that large in these superannuation funds have hundreds of billions of dollars under management. They are now telling governments what to do. They are that rich and powerful. Some of the money in these superannuation funds across the world are bigger than countries' economies. The power of this uh, centralised wealth is becoming a threat to democracy because the people running these things, like Larry Fink from BlackRock, who holds that bloke accountable? Who, are hold who holds the superannuation funds accountable when they decide they want to spend money on something? No one. You do not even get to appoint the board members. And can I say, and I'm, I'm glad Senator Pocock raised this, the Product Commi Productivity Commission found that $30 billion in fees are ripped out of superannuation every year. And for what? Nothing but paper shuffling. You want to know why we've got a, work, uh, a shortage of workers in this country? Because we've got too many blowhards in this country pushing pens and shuffling paper when they should be out there actually building infrastructure, you know, producing goods and services, rather than selling, buying and selling um, shares on the stock market all day that produces nothing. It produces nothing. Okay? This, this superannuation and, and the guys that rip off $30 billion each year, that is like they make Al Capone uh, look like Mother Teresa. This is the biggest racket going on since the Prohibition in the 1930s, mate. I mean, you, you want to get upset about bikey gangs. I tell you what, this superannuation funds, mate, they're extorting more money out of the workers' pockets every year right, than bikies ever do. And I'll tell you something else. 50 billion. You read the budget papers tonight. It'll be in the tax expenditures statement. There will be 50 billion dollars in tax concessions that mainly for superannuation that mainly go to the upper 20 per cent of income earners. Okay? It goes to the same people in those wealthy suburbs that Labor are now mates with, the Teals. Right? These guys, you know, if you want to talk about rorts and all the rest of it, what about the tax concessions that go to superannuation? And, and, and you know what? What's the pension for? The people who get the pension are the bottom 70 per cent of earners. So the bottom 50 per cent of earners, they get a full pension and the next 20 per cent get a partial pension. Right? They get very little of those tax concessions. The tax concessions for the wealthy now cost more, or just about they're, they're one or two billion short, now cost more than the cost of the pension. Now I would rather have a universal pension that was I would rather have I would rather have no, 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 don't, don't interject. Don't interject. This was introduced by Paul Keating. This was introduced by Paul Keating and it was pumped up all the time. And, and look, we, we shouldn't have pumped it up. And I, and I should acknowledge uh, Senator Richard Alston, who fought very hard against superannuation when it first came in. And we should never oppose it. The Liberal Party coalition have, should have opposed this from the get go. And I'll say that to my colleague, Senator Cadell, who's listening on here, because it rips out. 12 per cent of income from the regions goes down to the and, and Western Australia and those great magnificent towns in regional Western Australia, Senator Stirl, and it goes to the ivory palaces in Sydney and Melbourne where they shuffle their paper and they might come in and turn on their screen in the morning and then you know, go and get a coffee and then go and buy a zoot suit for this weekend's triathlon, come back, get a physio. Uh, you know, th these guys are not the people producing goods and services in this country and there is way too much money wasted on unproductive activity, and that is why I, I, I totally uh, reject superannuation. But I haven't, I haven't finished there. there. Of that 3.3 trillion, there's over a trillion dollars invested offshore in offshore infrastructure. This country is is crying out to be building more infrastructure. 
But you know what superannuation funds do? They don't build infrastructure, right? Because they haven't got the patient capital. The only entity that can build long-term infrastructure is actually the government, right? But these guys, what they won't do, but they'll buy infrastructure. And you'll notice how Australian Super went in and bought Sydney Airport last year, and you had the Auditor General running around running a protection racket for Sydney Airport. They didn't want the Western Sydney Airport uh, built, so they came up with this bogus argument that somehow we'd paid uh, too much for the land around Sydney Airport, which wasn't true. It was uh, anyone that knows uh, accounting standard AASB 29, uh, uh, AASB 13 knows that paragraph 29 and 30 says you pay uh, the highest market price regardless of valuation, even though it was actually valued in, uh, uh, zoned in the airport um, uh, as, as an airport uh, zoning. Now I should also add this superannuation robs Peter to pay Paul. Since superannuation has been introduced, the number of people who retire with a mortgage has increased from 10 per cent to 40 per cent. Right? So you've now got people who get to 60 or 65, they retire, they pull their superannuation out as a lump sum, they pay off their home loan and then they go on the pension. Now I've got a, someone that I knew that I used to work with in Sydney at Westfield who had bought a $3 million house in Seaforth had a million dollar deposit, he was 55, he was get, waiting to get to 65, he was going to pull out his pension, pay off his mortgage at Seaforth, the other two million, and then go on the pension. Right? So there are ways around this where wealthy people milk the system. But let me say this, if you've got a $500,000 mortgage and $100,000 in superannuation, you are being, you're getting clipped the ticket twice. You're getting fees on your actual superannuation fund and you're getting fees on your mortgage. It is much better to net off your investments uh, rather than get, clipped, you know, get shafted twice by financial institutions. Uh, so, but ultimately, this comes down to transparency, and, and I commend Senator Pocock for actually raising this and trying to bring this uh, disallowance into the House. And I have to say, I'm going to watch what the Greens do here very, very carefully, because they always go on about trans uh, transparency and accountability. So we better make sure that they support. I'll be very disappointed if they do not support Senator Co uh, Pocock, Pocock in this motion, um, because it will it will highlight their hypocrisy if they don't, and it will show that they too are subservient to the to the the, the union elites, not the members. Love the members. The members are the battlers of this country. And I want to be very clear here. I'm not going to attack unions per se. They have a role in this country to protect the battlers. But superannuation is not protecting the battlers. It is milking them dry. So I'd just like to finish on that note and, and just, you know, as I said, the Greens, this is your chance to stand up to Labor and show that you can uh, think for yourself. And I'm never going to let you guys forget this if you don't support this. But we need to stop the rorts, and there's no bigger rort in this country than superannuation. So there you have it. I think the Senator is correct. The superannuation system is not fit for purpose whilst it supports the financial system. And of course, it's also getting rather attractive now for those who would like to use superannuation balances to, for example, support housing. It's our money, and yet we don't seem to be able to control it or manage it. And in fact, but there are many financial intermediaries meeting a mozza right the way through. So this whole thing needs to be reviewed in my view. This is not fit for purpose. It probably was never designed to be fit for purpose from day one, but it was very much built around the neoliberal philosophy of let the markets rule and the assumption that markets will always go up. Well, the truth is markets quite often can go down as well, as many people are now beginning to realise. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.